Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning gathering of Byron Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us in person or online, we are delighted to have you join us in worshiping our great God this morning. Uh, whether you're a guest or a member, particularly those of you uh, guests or members that I've not had a chance to sit down with, I'm still trying to schedule meetings with our membership and would love to sit down and talk with you sometime in the coming weeks outside on a porch. We can spread out here in a big room in the, in the facility here. But uh, if you would just reach out, I would love to, to schedule some time with you. We have a business meeting this Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, we, it's a regularly scheduled business meeting. We had one last week for a couple of things um, that, that need to be dealt with last week, but uh, that means there will no, be no Wednesday night lesson, but we will pray. So we will use the balance of our time this Wednesday after our business meeting to pray for our church family, for our community, for our country. Uh, I sent out an email this week to the church regarding discipleship opportunities, fall small groups. Uh, there's an on, upcoming online conference that I ask you to take a look at. Uh, these are all uh, intriguing ways to, to plug into the life of the church and to further your walk with the Lord. That, that conference, there's, a, I don't know, 50 breakout groups. And so I'm not going to spend 50 hours in the coming uh, months watching those sessions. But if one of those intrigues you, I would love for you to join us that day. Or just tell me you want to watch this one later and, and hear back from you how your experience was with that breakout group. Uh, one thing that came out of our previous business meeting is uh, we voted Wednesday night to hire children's ministry director and administrative assistant. We had 50 applicants. Personnel committee worked through all that and we ended up uh, going with an inside hire of our own Wesley Maddox. So. We're very happy tomorrow Wesley Maddox comes on staff to, to lead our children's ministry and to help with the administrative functions of the church. And one final announcement. As this season wears on, we've been talking on Wednesday nights, there's some sermon application. This pandemic is, is really getting old for every single one of us. Hey. Uh, but I wanted to just put it out there that the first time we get to gather again on a Sunday night, which I don't know when that is yet, but, but we're going to sing and we're going to read scriptures, and that's what we're going to do, we're just celebrate being back together, celebrate at whatever point that is in the pandemic that we've made it that far. And, and so I want you to be thinking, if there's a song that, that God's used to encourage your soul during the season, I want you to be thinking about, um, about that song for that Sunday night. Or if there's a scripture that God's used, I want you to be thinking about that because we'll have people sing and we'll have people read scriptures. And it's just going to be a time to celebrate God's faithfulness in our lives. So, again, I don't have that date yet, but I want you to be thinking towards that day. That gets us through our announcements. And now, for the reason we have gathered, uh, we have found rest for our souls, those of us who are trusting in Christ. So I... Hope that these words of our Lord Jesus may usher us into a worship-filled hour this morning. Hear God's word from Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we gather together, we remember the goodness of our God. And even in the midst of a, of a pandemic where we can't go see the ones that we want to see and we can't be around each other, we have hope in our great God who is everlasting and almighty and has a plan in the midst of all this. Let's join together as we celebrate the greatness of our God. Would you stand with me as we sing, Everlasting God.
celebrate his goodness, we celebrate his greatness, but we celebrate his love, that he walks with us and carries us day by day. Sing to him now in the garden. morning to give you praise. Even now, as we, we join the heavenly chorus, we join with believers all over your creation this Lord's Day morning, crying out that you are worthy of our praise and worthy of our affections and worthy of our hope and all that we have. Father, we it's our delight to, to find our joy in you, the, the source of life and the source of joy. And Lord, we also corporately confess this morning that, that we don't always seek that out. We don't always look to you for our joy. Even as we just sung about walking and talking with you, we confess that is hard. And sometimes we feel distant from you. And we ask that you would forgive us for our cold-heartedness, for our lack of faith. Lord, even as we enter into Hebrews 11 this morning and we spend a few weeks just dedicated to, to learning more about what faith means and what it looks like, we confess that so often we struggle to believe. Lord, we, we want to act on what we see 
rather than what we know to be true in you. Lord, we thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be gathering again. Lord, even as we're still missing friends that that cannot yet come back, we are thankful to to be gathered into God's house for for these friends to at least be able to to see what is happening here. And for those that, that get to interact, even at a distance, Lord, we are grateful after our weeks and weeks apart to be to be gathering again. Father, we come needy as always, and this morning our hearts are, are a burden for Mr. Charles and Miss Kathy Hayes as Charles is uh, battling in the hospital. We thank you for the, the negative virus test. We pray that you would help them figure out what's going on with his swallowing and his gallbladder and all those things. We pray that you would strengthen him as he is lonely in that place. And we pray for Miss Kathy as well, Lord, that you would give her peace as, as she waits and as she um, feels so powerless in this situation. And Father, it reminds us of all those who are weary from, from this virus now, all those who've been put at a distance, whether in the, the medical profession or at a distance from loved ones in nursing homes and Alzheimer's care, uh, those that are in the hospital and, and we can't be with all the quarantining going on all around the Lord world. We know, Lord, that it is not good for us to be alone. And so we pray your grace and your mercy on us as we uh, endure this season. Father, it's our good pleasure to continue praying for our uh, 2020 vision from John 17. And today, Lord, we pray that you would help us to experience Jesus' joy. Lord, the joy that we just sung about, that, that, that we can, can be in relationship with our Maker. The joy that Jesus had and has with the Father. Lord, we want to enter in and we pray that you would help us to do that. Further. Uh, Father, up the road at Calvary Baptist, we pray for this sister church. We thank you for Brother Benjamin. We thank you for his testimony and his zeal for for making your name known. We pray your blessings on that ministry. We pray, Lord, even as Brother Benjamin has a heart for evangelism, that the gospel would go forth and that lives would be transformed by the gospel of grace. Father, we pray for new greater Allen Temple and Brother Charlie Hicks. And Lord, I thank you for the, the legacy that Brother Charlie is in this town. Lord, we pray that the gospel would go forth there as well, that disciples would be made, that the brothers and sisters in Christ there would be encouraged, that you would give them strength and fruit. Father, much further away, we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Beirut. Lord, we pray particularly for City Bible Church that lost everything in this explosion. Lord, thank you for for brothers and sisters around the world surrounding the the church in Beirut. And we pray particularly for that church, Lord, that you would bind them up and that you would provide what they need in this hard hour. Lord, as your word tells us to, we pray for those in leadership over us. And we pray this week for President Trump, for Vice President uh, Pence, for... Uh, the, the cabinet for those in that, that inner circle. Lord, we pray that you would guide them in your ways. Lord, none of us pretends to, to have the, the knowledge, the understanding to, to lead a, a nation of 300 million. And Lord, we just pray by your mercy that you would uh, lead our country through their leaders, through our leaders, Lord, that you would give them the grace and the wisdom they need. Father, right back here in our own building, in our own hearts, in our own church family, we pray that you would give us a right perspective. Lord, as we look out into the broken world, as we look inward and our broken hearts, we pray that you would give us a perspective. Help us to see the unseen. Lord, as we come to talk about faith here in a few minutes, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen our faith. That you would... Help us to to know you more, to know more your trustworthiness, to to give our lives away more for your great name, for your great glory, for that unshakable kingdom that you promised. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I've already mentioned this morning, we will come to Hebrews chapter 11 in our sermon series. And Hebrews 11.3 says... By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So we're going to spend the next few minutes worshiping God just by reading his creation account. 
of how he created everything that we can see by his word. So Rebecca, if you will come, and we will be reading Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Isn't it good to remember the deeds of our God? Amen. What he has done and his goodness and his might and his power that he could speak and it was so. His authority over all things. We serve a mighty mighty God. Would you stand with me as we sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And the goodness of our God. There's only one who could come up with the love of salvation. There's only one who could save us. There's only one who could even imagine sacrificing his own son. This morning as we come to praise him. As we come to praise him for his greatness. Let's also praise him for his mercy and his grace and his love. He is the only God.
how he's loved you. Praise him this morning for how he has saved you. Praise him for the goodness of who he is and the greatness of his love. Come and behold him, the one and the only. friends we we're about to talk about faith today see believing that which we cannot see and if you're questioning what it is Christians gather and sing about and get so excited about it's what we just saying that we believe there's a holy God and we see our sin we, we, we each of us see ourselves mess it up week after week and yet this God has made a way for us to be in relationship with him if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I'd invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I am a type 1 diabetic, and 19 years in, I am very confident that I'm diabetic. Now, I can't see my diabetes, but I have 19 years of evidence that help me be quite sure in fact, it, it affects me every hour of the day. Even during the night, I probably woke up, this was not a very good night last night, but six times with my insulin pump, alarming for various reasons. Diabetes is a big expense. I pay a lot of money for that insulin pump to drive me crazy all the time. It's always a factor. I checked, The last thing I did before I came up here, check my blood sugar, make sure I'm not going to have low blood sugar before I come up here. And yet I can't see it. It's very real. In so many areas of our lives, we have trouble with the unseen. We, we act on what we do see and neglect of what we do not. This bears out, of course, in our integrity. This is why we do things different when no one is looking. You know, you hear about the bad things, the people doing things behind the scenes. But then you also have... Uh, it affects every single one of us. Like you may not be tempted to steal and defraud when no one is looking, but if you're like me, you probably see a piece of trash and look at it differently if there's people around versus if it's just you and that piece of trash. Okay. Our integrity is affected by the unseen. Our generosity is affected by our faith. We, we want to hold on to something. As long as that money is still in our checking account, as long as we haven't given it away, we still hold the cards. We can choose to give it away later, but we're not left trusting something beyond our own resources. We certainly don't want to be in a place where we are simply having to trust God on our resources. We're often happy to trust Him for salvation. We're happy to trust Him praying for the sick. But when it comes to our generosity, it takes a lot of faith. Faith plays out in our worry as we look at life and, and all the problems. Worrying is a very reasonable response unless the God of the Bible exists. Amen. With our spiritual fruit, the difference in what we know on a Sunday morning, what we should do, what our lives should be like, versus how it plays out moment by moment during the week. It's a great difference. There's a tension between knowing what we should do and what those moments actually add up to. There's a tension in how we feel on a Sunday morning after we've sung only a holy God and we think about the people who need to know that this God has redeemed us and we think about our evangelism and then how hard it is in the moment. Or our discipleship, we hear over and over again we need to be making disciples and, but that's not convenient costly. Praying, trying to, to get out of bed early or stay up late to pray, to spend time with God. It, it's, it sounds great right now. And it gets really hard somewhere between lunchtime today and Wednesday. 
Same thing with studying the Word. So this morning, I want to ask the question, what does the Bible say about this tension between wanting uh, our, our flesh wanting to trust with our eyes and our other senses versus trusting our Maker? Hebrews 11 addresses this issue for us. So if you're able, I'm going to invite you to please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Hebrews 11, being in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Father, we have sung, we have prayed, we have listened to your word. And now, Lord, we want to, to look closely at your word because we want to be people of faith. Lord, we want to be counted with the Abels, with the Enochs, with the Noahs. We want to be counted with our own Lord Jesus Christ who believed. Lord, we need your help. Our flesh is weak. So we pray now, Lord, by your spirit that you would strengthen us. Strengthen us and encourage us by your word that we might see your trustworthiness, your glory, your love. And it might change the people we are for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Last week in chapter 10, we saw the need for endurance. Life is hard. There's coming a day when we will meet our maker. And we need to endure. And then coming up in chapter 12, we will see a similar message. In fact, you could almost leave chapter 11 right out of Hebrews and it would flow fine. Look, look at chapter 10, verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And then you skip over into chapter 12 and he refers to the cloud of witnesses that we've just been studying in 11. And he says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so closely, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So why chapter 11? He did the examples. Think about this, this group in Hebrews we've been uh, seeing week in and week out, that they were hard pressed, that their friends were in prison, that that they had lost possessions. Following Jesus had been costly. And it, it wasn't enough for the author just to tell them to endure. Now he's going to give us all of these men and women of the Old Testament scriptures who have endured, who have been commended by God. He uses this list of examples so that if they are tempted or if you are tempted to think that God's not going to pull through this time, you get to look back. And see God's faithfulness of old. And see his unchanging character. We get to be reminded of others who have endured. So in these first seven verses of Hebrews 11, we're going to see that faith is for the unseen. So my plan, Lord willing, in the coming weeks is we're going to just camp out on what faith is this week. And next week we're going to have an overview of chapter 11. See the big picture, and then we're going to dive into a couple of particular stories in the weeks after that in Hebrews 11. But this week, I want us to nail down what faith is conviction and assurance that He is who He says He is, and that He's good for His word. Let's continue in verse 2. For by it, that is faith, 
the people of old received their commendation. And what is commendation? Commendation is an attested example. It's a public witness of one's character. And so we see in verses 4 and 5 in our text this morning, as well as in 16 and 39 of this chapter, that God attests, He gives public witness to one's character for His children based on their faith. He bears witness, uh, this text bears witness to the Christian paradox of the hope of glory versus the frustration of this world. We, tell, we sing these great songs and, and, and we get excited that there's a God that loves us and yet life is still hard. We're still in the brokenness of this world. But people of old have received their commendation by believing in God through those hard times. They have been attested by God. It did not mean that their life became easy, that they were living the blessed life. It's not a promise for this life. We'll see that particularly next week as this whole chapter is filled of people who, who did not get uh, that, that blessed life. They didn't experience everything that you could hope for in this life. And yet there's only one right response to God's signature in this world. And that is to loan him your life. Loan him the funds. Loan him whatever he asks. You might say, but I can't see. It's certainly hard to see. It's certainly hard to act on faith. And so our author goes now back to the beginning to give us the paradigm. Verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Verse 3 serves as an illustration of verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 3 tells us that we are loaning our life based on the very words of God, the one who gives life, who speaks it into being. What is more important, the created thing or the creator? By faith, we understand or grasp intellectually that God's word brought into existence and ordered the universe. As we read earlier, there was no light. God spoke and then there was light. There was, uh, there was no dry ground and God spoke and dry ground appeared. There were no birds, and then God spoke, and there were birds. Similarly, by faith, we understand that Jesus upholds the same world by his powerful word. We saw it in verse 3 of chapter 1, that we, we see that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. The earth keeps orbiting the sun at 93 million miles away by the word of his power. I looked this up this week because, yeah, as you may have can tell, I love the sun. It's really impressive. It keeps burning 600 million tons of hydrogen every second at the word of his power. 600 million tons of hydrogen every second, year round, year after year, at the word of our Lord Jesus Christ's power. Your heart beats at the word of of Jesus. The universe can be seen though its origins cannot. Doctors still can't explain my diabetes or how to fix it or where it came from very well. Yet here we are. And here we are in God's creation. And we look at his word and we trust it for what it is. Faith fixes our hope on the invisible. We, in our flesh, when we're not seeking to walk by faith, we grab onto things and we trust things we can hold. And all of those things are temporal. Faith moves us from the temporal to the immortal. By faith, we understand where we came from and where we are going. By faith, we understand what matters. In God's economy, the unseen is greater than the seen. I mentioned earlier how our integrity um, can struggle with our faith. How does this affect our integrity? Well, if God has signed off on the future, we can give it all to Him. It does not matter who the audience is in any given moment. It does not matter if we can, quote, get ahead when no one is looking. <laughs> they don't matter in this scenario. 
his credit score. The credit score of our God is written in the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith we trust his ways. The author now gives us an example in verse 4. Look with me in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So all these by faith formulaic introductions that we'll see in chapter 11 point to these lives being characterized by the faith that we just read about in verses 1 to 3. So Abel's our first example. He offered the best and desired to live for the unseen God. Remember the Hebrews that we're off his writing to here. They're struggling. They've lost a lot. They've lost friends. And he points them to Abel. And here comes Abel with the best sacrifice. The, the fattened calf. The best of his flock. Abel didn't have ten grand in his checking account. He's second generation. There's no store of wealth. This is risking it all to bring before a holy God. To, to, to come and say, by faith, God, you deserve my best. This is the example the author of Hebrews points to. Sadly, the other part of Abel's story is Cain. And it, it should be uh, telling to us, church, that within one generation of people walking with God, you have Cain. And his highest aim was not for the unseen God. He, he held back. He kept the best for himself. And Adam and Eve had to have told him about this God. That he had to know. And yet he did not believe. You see the danger? That's one generation. Satan is much more likely to cause you to drift from believing in the unseen than he is to drop a disbelief bomb of some sort on you. Satan likes for you to drift. Hold fast, friend. Hold fast to this God. Being commended or attested as righteous by God is greater than what anything we can, we can come up with in this life. Abel offered by faith. He was commended by God in God's acceptance of the gift. So what do we do with that today, church? I think it means, like Abel, we are to be generous. Our flesh, we want to hold on to things. I, I, I'm right there with you. Whether you, if you make less money than, than I make, then I have more to give. If you make more money than me, then I give a, what I give hurts more. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, all of us. It, 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 generosity across the spectrum, it hurts. Whatever it is, a dollar can hurt, a hundred dollars can hurt, or a thousand dollars can hurt. But our hope is that God is our provider. Our motivation is that we are stewarding his resources and the fruit of walking by faith in, in our possessions is that we can, we can give without one hand knowing what the other does as the gospels commend we can look, we can actually actively look for opportunities to be generous and sometimes we'll get burned a handful of families in our church got burned this week it happens it's God's economy. It's, 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 it's about us and Him. It's the unseen. We don't know what God is doing. We just want to be a part of it. We just want to communicate. God, we trust you. We trust you with our finances. We trust you with our time. There are opportunities galore in this church and in this city to serve others. Oh, that we'd be generous out of our faith in the unseen God. To be commended by God is greater than any wealth or security or free time this world can secure. One more thing to tell you about Abel before we move on. Abel did die an unjust death. Living for the unseen does not promise anything for the seen. It is faith in life and in death. Friends, there was another man who would later make the perfect sacrifice. And he would also die an unjust death. In fact, he would die the least just death in the history of humankind. And his name was Jesus. And if you're visiting with us today, if you're contemplating Christianity, the, this Jesus is the reason that we gather. This Jesus, unlike Abel, who was a sinner, was sinless. And this Jesus offered himself up. And, and some religious people of the day trumped up charges 
And even though he had lived a perfect life, they came with false witnesses and, and ideologies that were able to lead him to a wooden cross where he laid down his life as a sacrifice by faith to God. And just as the scriptures say that Abel's blood still speaks a better word, so this Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Because you and I are sinners. And we are separated from this holy God that we've been reading about and singing about. And we cannot get back to him. But this Jesus did not come in and just wipe out the brokenness. This Jesus entered into the brokenness. He took on flesh. He lived the life you and I couldn't live. He died in our place so that sinners could be reconciled to God. So that we could say, God, my righteousness is not sufficient. I want the righteousness of Jesus that you have offered. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. It's a free gift of eternal life offered in this Jesus. Abel was not the last man to die an unjust death after walking by faith. Another example in verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken he was commended as having pleased God. The significance here in Enoch's example of living by faith is not so much in his not dying, as interesting as that may be, but that he was commended by God. The author is saying here, being commended by God is greater than not dying. If we had an hour and a half sermon, we would dive further into Enoch not dying, but we are going to move on from here as it leads us to the timeless principle of verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We see here in verse 6 that pleasing God in the first part and drawing near are set in parallel. Without faith and impossible are also paralleled by believe and must. You will not please the unseen God without believing in him. We just saw it last week in verse 38. It's a quote from the Old Testament. But the word was, my righteous one shall live by faith. You will not draw near to the unseen God without faith in his son. The the sacrifice, the priest that we've been reading about from chapters 5 to 10. You will not please God by a generic belief in a God but rather the one of chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We find that long ago in various ways, God spoke to us by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That is the God that we go to. And then we find, as I've already mentioned in verse 3, that this Jesus who he sent now upholds the universe by the word of his power. So we read earlier that God's word acted to bring creation into existence, and we find that God's word has acted again, this time bringing peace between himself and his image bearers. I mentioned 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 earlier. Well, 4.6 says more positively about the Christian, to the Christian. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is what he has given us, church. That is though that we might draw near to him. That we might draw near to our Father, made possible by this precious blood spilt to bring about our adoption. We find that he rewards Forever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That he makes it worth it. The literal translation of that in the Greek would be that he becomes the rewarder. God himself becomes the rewarder. Uh, it's an old term. It's not one we use now, but he becomes the paymaster. At the end of the day, when it's time to get paid, he is the one who takes on that title. We've seen it in verses 1 to 5, but... What reward are we talking about? Well, it's all over Hebrews, but I'll say 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, sum it up nicely. A better and abiding possession, a great reward. Friends, he signed his signature all over that mortgage document. 
Loan it to Him. Loan it to Him. He's good for it. He will reward. He'll pay it back. Moses, we'll find in a couple of weeks, or next week as we read the whole chapter, was looking forward to this reward in verse 26. But there's better news still. Not only is this God trustworthy, but He knows what it is to walk by faith. Jesus had to walk by faith. We're going to get there, Lord willing, in a few weeks. But chapter 12, verse 2, we're encouraged, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is our example. He too had to live by faith. He believed in the rewarder. He, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. We get one more example here in our text of living by faith in the unseen, and that's Noah. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events, as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Genesis 6-9 tells us that uh, Noah was righteous like Abel, and he also walked with God like Enoch. Noah had a right response to God's warning of things yet unseen. Noah responded with crazy, radical obedience. Can you imagine having never seen any kind of flooding, possibly not even ever being on any significant body of water and building an ark bigger than this room we're in? Can you imagine the faith of Noah? By his faith, he condemned the faithfulness, faithlessness of the world. So you see in verse 7, those who were enjoying God's creation without enjoying the Creator, or while neglecting the Creator. We see he also became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He, he Noah, shared in the inheritance of the Son, whom we found to be the heir of all things. Chapter 1, verse 2. Now Noah is one of the great examples of responding in faith to God's Word. He is given uh, to us as an example, as well as to the Hebrews. They're struggling. We're struggling. Now, I don't think we're struggling like the Hebrews were struggling, but in various ways, all of us are are hurting on different levels and in different seasons. And Noah is held out there as an example to await the unseen judgment and the reward we talked about last week in chapter 10. To see what salvation looks like. Christian, we need to picture the flood. And we need to know that it was God's grace towards Noah and it is God's grace towards us. To save us from the coming wrath. Only you believe. Friends, the flood of Noah's day was nothing. It was but a taste of the flood of wrath that is coming on the last day. For all those who reject the goodness of our God and Christ Jesus. So Noah looked with reverent fear. He... He, he looked out and said, yes, the right response to this God is to walk by faith. To live for the unseen. Krishna, I want to ask you, what have you done out of reverent fear lately? In the last week, what have you done by faith? It's not a guilt trip. It's not a thing, easy thing to answer. But, but we're going to stand before this God one day. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Christian, what have you done by faith? What, how has reverent fear categorized your life this week? It's not just that we are saved from our sins, but we are brought into a family. We are heirs of righteousness. We're brought into, what, into Jesus' taking. I had a friend trying to encourage me uh, this week and saying something that affects like heavenly rewards. And I was like, brother, I'll take Jesus' inheritance. Thank you. Like whatever I may deserve in this life, I'll take my big brother Jesus. I'll take a cut of his inheritance. That's what we're living for. That's what we want. Being an heir of righteousness moves us from the worry that we talked about earlier. 
our hope can move from the things that we're concerned about to a good, good Father who will not let a hair on our heads be touched apart from His goodwill. It moves us from looking at the seen into praying to the unseen. It, it turns our attention from things that bother us to fear of God, to, to crying out to Him. I mean, think about Noah. Think about the mocking that, I mean, we read in the children's story. We don't know for sure. But inevitably, the mocking that had to have taken place as he builds this ark on dry land. Where did he turn? He turned to his father. Think about Jesus when he was mocked. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the faith is the active belief that the word, salvation, kingdom, inheritance, and the reward offered by God in Christ if, if faith is actively believing those things, then what should it look like for us on a Sunday afternoon? I want to close with one more application. I want to tell you this morning that God is okay with you growing in your faith. Like if you're still spinning your wheels about that question, what did I do by faith this week? That's okay. The right response is, Lord, help me. Remember what faith is. It is actively believing God and His promises. Saying, God, help me. Help me. Help my unbelief. Realizing that hope that is seen is no hope at all. Romans 8.24 This is a lifelong exercise of continuing to hope in the unseen. And it, faith fixes our hope. It, it moves us from what we can see to, to fruit that will last. From the perishable to the imperishable. So what I want to challenge you with this morning is by faith, look to bear spiritual fruit. The difference in what we talked about earlier on a Sunday morning versus what the rest of the week looks like. The difference in evangelism and discipleship and studying and praying God's word back to him. What is faith? It is the act of believing God and his promises. So by faith, that is assurance in the unseen, eager to please the unseen God, we risk ostracizing ourselves for the sake of the gospel. And our evangelism, like it's just awkward. No one wants to tell somebody they're a sinner and they need a savior. That's not the American dream. It, it is awkward. But by faith we risk ostracizing ourselves. By faith we decide that being commended by God is greater than being commended by our neighbor. More than that, by faith we're praying ahead. We're looking at our schedule. We're building our lives around opportunities to share this good news. By faith we are looking for that unseen work. I make excuses too. It hadn't happened since this week that I was like, well, it'll feel heavy-handed if the pastor you know, feeds them and then shares the gospel. I did that this week. It happens. By faith and in God's strength, let's stop that. By faith, we can get out of bed in the morning and seek the Lord. By faith, we can turn off the distractions. By faith, we can find new things to pray for so that we spend more time energized, crying out to God for the needs of our broken world. By faith, we don't just read the scriptures to get it done. We study, we contemplate, we meditate, and we memorize God's word. And that was a mouthful. I just, I just gave you hours worth of homework right there. But it's by faith. I'm not saying you have to do all those things at once. But by faith, we say, God, you're worth, it. You're worth more than what I did last week. One last challenge, still in the spiritual fruit. By faith, we engage in spiritual conversations with someone. I'm in an evangelistic accountability pastors group here in our area. And we, we had to set goals for ourselves and, and for our churches. And my goal for our church, so my goal for each member of this church, is that once per week, you will have a spiritual conversation with someone. A spiritual conversation. Now my goal for myself, I have a fair number of spiritual conversations. My goal is to have a spiritual conversation with someone who's unchurched. So it doesn't mean I necessarily present the gospel every week, but I want to turn an unchurched conversation to the gospel. I want you to have a spiritual conversation with someone. To move from the seen to the unseen. To take that relationship deeper. That's my challenge for our membership today. I know it's awkward, but by faith, those are the most important conversations we will have. So much of God's work is unseen. So in conclusion this morning, church, if faith is acting in belief, then we need to consider what we believe. Then we need to consider how much we believe it. 
which will determine how we act. Oh, church, how much more does the Lord Jesus Christ need to do for you that you will believe that he loves you? And to the non-Christian, to those of you who have not put your faith and trust in Jesus, how much more must Jesus do to be qualified to be your Savior? Whether it's right now as we sing with me or, or later today, or commenting on Facebook, friend, will you contemplate this Jesus? Contemplate whether or not he should be the Savior of your soul. Let's pray. Father, we are so blessed to, to call you Father. Lord, we, we, we utter that word and we don't even think about its implications of what you have done, of the signatures that you have signed in the blood of Jesus so that we can call you Father, so that we can look forward to a day that, that in the new heavens and the new earth with you, we will be with you forever, that all of these wrongs will be made right, that your glory will be knowing that the faith we've talked about today will become sight. It'll work in our hearts, oh God. Work in our hearts. We, we want to be a people of faith. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name.
can remain standing. Uh, just two brief announcements. If you're visiting with us today, I would love to, to meet you. I'll be right outside these main doors as, as we go. And uh, we continue to have ushers lead us out. So if you'll wait just a moment, an usher will guide you out so we can maintain social distancing. As you go, would you hear this good word from the Lord from 2 Thessalonians? Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.